Welcome everyone um, to this LSNTAP and PBN community training. Uh, today's training is a fun one and it's one that um, has been done in several iterations over the years called 50 Tech Tips You Should Absolutely Know. Uh, my name is Travis August. I'm the National Support Coordinator at ProbonoNet and um, I'll be the moderator today as well as a panelist uh, providing some tech tips. In addition to me, we have a great panel set up today. We have um, Patrick Noonan from the Minnesota Legal Services Coalition. Uh, we have Kate Blado, uh, a great nonprofit techn technology consultant and blogger um, at Technola. And we have Tony Liu, um, the, the uh, Special Initiatives Coordinator at Permonet based in New York. So as we get started, I'm going to turn this over to Patrick, who's going to run us through our first uh, 50 tech tips. Okay, thanks, Travis. Um, all right, hi everybody. My name is Patrick Noonan from the Minnesota Legal Services Coalition. Uh, thanks, Travis and Permonet for inviting me to do this today. It's been pretty fun. Uh, project to work on. So I was just going to um, show you some programs that I like to use and think are cool. Uh, the first one is called Kaku. Uh, it's an online flowchart and diagram creator. You can go on and uh, use nifty little pictures. You can use, uh, you can use uh, people and boxes and you can draw lines and arrows and things. You can also um, share your uh, diagrams with other people and they can, you can collaborate with them on diagrams and flowcharts in real time. You can chat with them live and you can export it in a variety of formats like uh, PNG, PDF uh, and use it and share it and it's great. I've had, I've tried to use other tools before for creating diagrams like like just uh, Microsoft Word's diagram tool and it feels like a big hassle compared to this. So I think this is a really cool one. Next is, next is a similar one. It's called 280slides.com. And this is basically PowerPoint on the internet. It's still in the beta phase, so um, I tried using it. It's a little bit buggy, but I think when, in a little while when it gets more up and running, it's going to be a lot better. It has a lot of the same functionality as PowerPoint. You can upload normal PowerPoint presentations to it. You can also download presentations that you've created on it into PowerPoint. And um, if you upload a PowerPoint presentation to this or create or use it to create a PowerPoint presentation, you can access it from anywhere online with just a link instead of having to carry a file around. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of the same functionality that you would have with normal PowerPoint. It is, as it's in the, uh, as it's in the beta phase, it is still a little slow and clunky. So I don't really use it a whole lot yet, but I would like to be able to soon. Next, this one is one that I actually use on a, on a daily basis. It's called Calibri and it's for Windows computers. Um, basically what you do with Calibri is you hit the control space and this little bar pops up and you can start typing in whatever you want into it. You don't have to type iTunes. You could type in uh, Word or PowerPoint or FileZilla and it will bring up the program that you're searching for almost instantaneously. You can also do a lot of other interesting things with it. If you type in Google, it will launch Google in your default browser, whatever that happens to be. Um, and it makes it a lot quicker to navigate through your computer. Um, on, our, on our little pre-call pre -call warm-up session, Kate mentioned that there's a similar program like this for Macintosh called Alfred. Um, I haven't tried it. I think it's named after Batman's butler, but I'm not sure. Um, and it has a lot of the same functionality, I believe. But this is a really, really cool one, and I really recommend this one. This one's called Doc Scanner. It's great if you have a uh, smartphone with a good camera, such as an iPhone or a Mac, or an Android, I should say. And it also works if you have a good camera and a Mac. You can basically take a picture of any document and uh, convert it into a PDF instantaneously. Uh, and that creates searchable, rich, uh, I don't know about rich text, searchable text, however. And um, I think it's a really efficient way to, to, to scan, essentially. Um, so. Yeah, that, it's really simple and there's not a whole lot else to say about it. This one's called JPEG Mini. Um, I think it's really great if you are uploading or storing a lot of photos. It shrinks your JPEGs um, to almost, well, in this example that they have on their, on their page, it's six times the size. Um, it just reduces the file size. It doesn't reduce the size of the photo, and it doesn't reduce the quality of the image either. As you can kind of see by the way they demonstrated here, this is the original. This is it after it's been shrunk by JPEG Mini. Uh, and it's really neat. If you have a website 
and you want it to load faster and you're using JPEGs as images, you can, you can shrink them and reduce their file size so it will load faster for people. If you have um, any kind of like online storage account with a limited amount of space, you can shrink your photos and store a lot more photos. So there's a lot of good uses for this. Next, next is Lawstack, which I thought, I just, I just kind of found it and thought that it would be interesting for this particular group if you're actually lawyers and if you have a, if you have a, a smartphone, an iPhone, I should say, you can have a, a legal library in your pocket, as they call it, and it has uh, all these different rules and you can download additional titles from within the app. And um, it just gets really good reviews. I actually don't use it, I just thought it would be great uh, to mention to people here because um, it seemed really relevant. <laughs> so keep going. This is kind of a kind of a funny one, but kind of not. If you're a if you're a writer of any kind and you sometimes need to find a word that you can't think of, then you can go and use the one look reverse dictionary where you, you type in the gist of the uh, the gist of the definition of the word and it responds with the word itself. And in order to test this, um, I tested it on, on fish-like dinosaur to see if it would bring up ichthyosaur as the number one result, and lo and behold, it did. So um, I think that if it, if it can get ichthyosaur and, and, and match that with fish-like dinosaur, then um, it must be pretty good. <laughs> and it's also good just for, for normal things when you, when you can't quite think of, of what the word is. This is something that I use quite a bit, uh, w3schools.com. It's a website that shows tutorials for a lot of different web tools and languages. You can learn HTML and HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, um, all, these different, all these different languages. And a lot of times, if you're like me, perhaps you um, are using tools created by ProBonoNet, um, which only require you to use HTML every so often or or you, you, you use uh, web languages, but you use them in a limited capacity. So I find that this is a great place to go when I need to find out one specific thing, uh, how to do something specific. I have one problem and I need to look up kind of how to do that thing. I can do that here. Um, this next one is called What the Font. <laughs> and I really like this because I've, I've sometimes had to try to replicate logos uh, or other images from websites and I want to be able to use the same font that they have but I don't know what the name of the font is and um, it can be kind of a long arduous process of guessing and trying to match it but with this website you can take a picture of the font or a screenshot and upload it here and continue and then um, you have to, after clicking continue, I should have probably uploaded a screenshot of that, answer a few extra questions about the picture, like it will say, is this character a, an N or a U? And you tell it what the, what the letter is, and then it will tell you what the font is. And um, it's, it's, I've tested it just uh, on normal fonts that I already knew the answer to, and it's uh, gotten it all right. So it works really well if you ever need to know what a font is, <laughs> and you're trying to replicate something in particular. This is a really handy scheduling tool called When is Good. Um, it's basically a, a thing where instead of trying to have a bunch of emails back and forth between different people, you can, you can have them all go to this link and mark off with their mouse which, which days and times work for them. So it's kind of, they, they refer to it as painting over what, what times are good. You would just click and drag over whatever works for you and it will highlight it. And then whoever sets it up, whoever has set it up, then can see what times work for everybody and they can schedule a meeting. And um, I think a lot of tools like this are becoming really popular. I know Tony's got another one called Doodle that he's going to show you too. It's also uh, really handy, uh, especially when you're organizing with people who are outside of your network and they don't, you don't share an Outlook calendar with them. Um, it's really easy to use and it's great. <laughs> This is called Cooler, and it's at cooler.adobe.com. It's, it's a tool that helps you come up with color themes. Basically, there's a whole world in the science to color matching theory, picking colors that complement each other and balance each other well. And if you, don't, if you never took a class on it, you might not really know how to do it. But this Cooler tool does it for you automatically. 
Um, you can select different types of color. You can go, for example, this is a, this is a compound uh, theme, and that just means I don't even know what it means. Uh, <laughs> but if you if you were to choose uh, triad, for example, then these these dots would be sort of in a triangle shape on here, and uh, all the colors match each other really well. And it makes you look like you really know how to choose colors. And I use it sometimes for if I'm just designing simple pages and I want them to look good, or anytime I have to pick a color for any kind of media material. Um, cooler is a, a great way to do it. Uh, this is kind of a, a low-tech tech tip. It's a uh, Google SMS. I don't actually own a smartphone, even though I've shared some tech tips for smartphones. Uh, this one is that you can you can text a text message to Google. 466-453 is their number. And I've used it many times uh, when I need to find an address or a phone number of a place. I'll be out and about, and I don't know how to get there, or I don't know how to contact them, or I, or I don't know their hours of a store or something like that. Uh, you can use really old school technology uh, to take advantage of this feature, as, as, as is illustrated by this ancient Motorola phone, which would have been really cool about 10 years ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and this one is called Jing. Uh, for those of you who haven't used Jing, it's a really, really excellent tool to do image capture and also video capture from your, from your screen, from your desktop. Uh, it's made by TechSmith. Um, it basically gives you, the way it works is you download it quickly. This little uh, sun icon kind of lives on your desktop all the time. There's just a little, a little ball sticking out from the side of your, of your frame, of your screen, maybe here. And when you hover over it, it gives you this little panel of tools. You click on this uh, plus sign and suddenly you have a, a box, a rectangle creator that you can use to select any area of the screen and take a picture of it. After you've taken a picture of it, um, you can draw arrows to it, you can create boxes, you can type really, really easily. Um, it's, it's a real excellent way to create tutorials uh, or just tell people, or just communicate with people in a visual way. You can also use it to do um, desktop video. You hit record and um, it records your screen for, I think, up to three or five minutes. Uh, and so you can create videos, and including with audio, I believe. I actually haven't tried it with audio, but uh, it's, uh, it's great. And finally, we have the Universal Decision Maker, <laughs> which I use uh, dozens of times every single day. You come to it, and you click on Start, and these two little bug-like objects race from this yes and no section, and uh, whichever one wins uh, gives you the answer. So as you can see in this test run, the answer is yes. And I can't remember what the question was, but at least I know the answer to it. Great. Thank you very much, Patrick. <laughs> Thanks, Rufus. <laughs> Universal Decision Maker and what the font are in the running for my favorite of those two. Um, so next up, uh, we have Kate Blato from Technola. And Kate, should I, I have control? to? Um, I have to say that what the font uh, has been a huge saver for me to a uh, great tool. Um, so uh, a few tools that I have. Um, but, uh, sort of the first is for people who may be wanting to take payments, whether it's from clients or that you're at an event where you want to get payment from an attorney or that you happen to be, you know, for some reason selling a product at a conference that there's an application called Square that um, you get the reader and the application for your phone for free and you attach the reader to your phone um, and you're able to just slide credit cards uh, across and that um, I used it at the N10 National Technology Conference um, and that uh, was really easy to use that you were able to sort of input products and that they say that there's a really great reporting feature on the end and that um, all of it gets dumped into an account that you specify. Then uh, talking a little bit more about fundraising, that there um, uh, is a neat tool that you can use to make your tweets and Facebook posts 
account that you um, are able to go on and sort of log in with your Twitter account or your Facebook account and um, opt to pledge a certain amount per tweet um, or per fa Facebook post um, to uh, a, a nonprofit um, and that you can do it based on your own um, tweets, you can do it on a hashtag, so if you want to encourage people to tweet during a conference or a certain event, um, that you can go ahead and do that, and then it allows you to uh, sort of let your, your followers and your friends know that you're doing this and encourage them to do it as well. Um, I'm really looking forward uh, to a new feature that they're going to add, which is um, integration with Foursquare. So people will be able to, when they check in at Foursquare, that you'd be able to get a donation um, per each of those check-ins. And that I see that as being a potential really um, interesting feature for businesses who want to support organizations, that for people who check in at their stores or bakeries or whatever it happened to be, that they'll give a certain amount to an organization. Um, Another uh, sort of social media piece is LinkedIn for nonprofits, that LinkedIn has just released a whole new set of features focusing on um, how nonprofits can use uh, LinkedIn and that if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you really should, um, that it's simply a way that you have sort of your resume and professional, um, sort of the professional you out online and that LinkedIn has some really good search engine optimization um, to it for both you and your organization. So if people are going and they're searching, you know, they're Googling for you after a conference, that they're more likely to be able to find you if you have a LinkedIn profile and be able to connect with you and remember that you're there. Um, you're also now, um, you can get your board members and others to specify that they're volunteers with your organization um, and have that show up on their profile. So it could be a great opportunity for people who are recruiting pro bono attorneys to get existing um, folks to uh, let others know that they're volunteering through their LinkedIn profiles. Um, and then there is Just Cause, and this service allows you to um, donate a tweet a day to help spread awareness. So if I, you know, that uh, Maryland Legal Aid Bureau here in Maryland, um, I could opt to donate a tweet each day to them and that they would have an account um, through their account that they could just sort of push that tweet out into my stream. Um, and that uh, a day for them is sort of every 24 hours and that uh, a good example of a group that was using this is Epic Change and they used it as part of a campaign to sort of promote um, getting people to donate and push, you know, respond in terms of uh, uh, what they loved because it was a campaign um, about Mother's Day to Mama with Love um, for a mother that they were working with around education. Um, when you're doing content that often you're looking for pictures and that um, while well, clip art can be used appropriately and sort of is great for certain things that sometimes you want um, people's faces um, but don't have the resources to go out and uh, you know take the photos yourself that if you go to Flickr that you're able to search there for content that's been licensed under the Creative Commons which allow you to be able to use it um, depending on the license that there is uh, to either use it with attribution or that you may even be able to use it commercially or to build upon it and that there is an entire um, search feature that allows you to search specifically for that content um, and that there's some really great pictures in there that you can use. Next um, is uh, tied to that is uh, just a, a simple way to attribute you know items, the items you use under the creative Commons, um, and that I took it from a blog post uh, from somebody else, and that it's just a really great format to, you know, start using. That if you're using those images and blog posts, to make certain that it's there, and you're giving credit to the people who actually put the content together. Then I wanted to do, um, sort of in the networking. Um, of connecting that sort of online world with the offline world of social networking that I wanted to encourage people to take a look at meetup.com um, that if you're looking for training or opportunities to get together with other people around a certain technology um, areas that is a great place to uh, look for that and that they have things even beyond um, technology that if you're interested in a sort of specific kind of dog they're often meetup groups um, or you may find a, a writers group if you're looking for ways to write better web content um, in Baltimore that there's actually even a group uh, for people who are looking at business strategy it's a business strategy um, 
book group that uses Meetup to meet, and all you have to do is you sign up um, for a certain group, and they'll uh, let you know when meetings are happening, and then you can RSVP and go. Um, also, I wanted to sort of encourage people um, to look at their local tech community. It's not it's not a tip, you know, for online, but it's a, a tip uh, for something happening in your community that there are often nationally that there's a lot of energy within tech startup communities around making the world a better place and sort of um, that there's a lot of this energy that you can draw and people that you can um, meet in terms of getting to know other people who may be able to help your organization that may be able to mentor you in terms of technical skills. Um, here in Baltimore that in the past year that we've had um, a startup weekend where people from across the East Coast got together to sort of start creating projects and in the fall in November that there will be an education hack day where a similar thing will happen to create solutions around um, education and sort of the Baltimore schools being able to uh, you know, solve problems that they don't have the technology to solve using the local tech community. Um, and that these aren't unique to Baltimore, that this sort of thing is happening across the nation. Um, I'd use to find these groups. I'd f use meetup.com to sort of figure out where they're meeting and sort of people are interested. Um, and then also wanted to encourage you in terms of um, thinking about the internet and your use of it. Um, create creatively that here in Baltimore um, after sort of in the summer around when Congress was um, trying to figure out budget issues that uh, we had a, a guy Chris Ashworth who actually creates uh, software for theaters um, that he had this random idea one night that he would create a site that was called slow clap for Congress and while he's a web developer that he didn't use um, any really sophisticated tools that basically he used a camera, filmed a video of him doing a really slow clap, um, and then put it up on a very, um, on a website without any significant design. And that he ended up, um, as a part of this, um, you know, ended up sort of creating, getting other people to give videos of themselves doing a slow clap but also ended up being able to get the attention of major news outlets as a part of this um, and even people in Congress that um, a verified account on Twitter from a um, congressman in Georgia said that it was making the rounds there and that the Washington Post um, had a headline that said that Congress responded to the so clap um, by you know resolving a, a mess around uh, some of the national transportation stuff and that um, Chris said that he knew that it probably wasn't a true headline um, but you actually um, but he said that even if it was a little bit true that it was a pretty given the fact that it was a really small idea that he didn't expect to do anything um, that it was sort of a good use of his time so keep thinking creatively about how you'll use the internet um, Another project um, that I'm really excited about is the Noun Project, where they're taking and they're putting easy to use um, icons on the web um, that they uh, uh, take and that they are all uh, free to use. I think that they're usually Creative Commons icons and that you can download them and use them on different things. Um, and that they are constantly creating more and have been having I iconathons over the summer um, to get different icons in different areas like education. Um, and certainly if you're creating icons, you can um, give them to the Noun Project so that other people can use them too. Um, and then something that I have become a huge fan of, um, if you use Google Calendar, that there's a new feature that allows you to set up appointment slots. And this allows you to avoid the going back and forth of scheduling meetings. Um, what happens is that you go, um, similar to sort of scheduling just a regular event on your calendar, you go, you highlight something, um, and instead of uh, having an event, you set it up as an appointment slot. And then this, um, through this, they, it gives you a link that you can send um, to your contact, and then they see a calendar with uh, these appointment slots open, sort of in the background there, that you can see all of the different appointments, and that when they decide what to do, they can click on it um, and reserve it, and that it sends uh, you an email to let you know that that slot has been reserved. And I believe, oh, the uh, sort of that they're 
also um, is for security nerds out there that um, Team Cymru, um, which uh, is a, a Gaelic word um, uh, that they use, uh, has a YouTube channel that weekly that they put up videos that explore um, the underground economy, um, which basically is how uh, hackers are using the internet um, to make money in sort of nefarious ways and that they go through um, and have videos of really basic things explaining what botnets are and sort of other items as well as um, a few videos discussing sort of trends and habits of uh, the miscreants that they're they're watching. Um, it's a great company that does both, um, has both a sort of private uh, and nonprofit entity to sort of help internationally around tracking the bad things that are going on online. And then if you're not subscribed to N10's new quarterly journal change, um, that you should be, that it is a journal, about a 40-page journal that comes out um, quarterly that is intended for nonprofit leaders, not necessarily techies, but I still find it really interesting and helpful that's talking about um, new technologies and what people are doing and sort of the basic questions nonprofit leaders have when they're trying to figure out what to invest in. Um, and while 40 pages sounds like quite a bit, that it is beautifully illustrated and has all sorts of great um, uh, pictures and sort of breaks the content down so it's really easy to read and a pretty fast read. Um, and if you sign up at n10.org slash n10change that they will email you when it comes out. Um, so, uh, and that one is the last one. Great, thanks Kate. Um, so next up is Tony Liu. Um, so with that, um, I will pass it over to Tony. Thanks, Travis. Uh, the first set of my tips have a lot to do with my personal journey towards uh, plain text um, after many, many years of fighting with Microsoft Word over formatting issues. Um, and, um, you know, so that, that first tip, tip is just use more plain text. Uh, if you could advance to the next one, Travis. So plain text files, everybody probably has seen the, the notepad application on a Windows machine or text edit on a Mac. It's, it comes on every standard install of operating systems. And the reason, you know, plain text has kind of enjoyed a renaissance lately. And I think a lot of it has to do with the, um, the rise of mobile devices because no one wants to be trying to write text in a Word document on a, you know, an Android or an iPhone. Um, to the extent that you even could, and so plain text is a way to get text content from a computer to a, a mobile device very quickly. It's very small, lightweight, and portable. It's also future-proof and platform agnostic. Any, you know, you could have like a whole zip drive, a uh, USB drive full of uh, plain text files and go from computer to computer and never have to worry about installing any kind of application because almost every operating system will have something that will read and probably write a plain text file. Uh, it's great for writing drafts. Uh, a lot of times I think when those of us who have, have to do any kind of writing, legal briefs or grant reports or anything, um, you can get lost in all of the formatting features or playing with like, oh, should I bold this heading? Should I, oh, should I go into the formatting and change all the heading styles now or should I do it later? It's when you need to write, you just need to write, and plain text is great to just clear away all those distractions. Um, and it can be, as I said, it can be read and edited easily on mobile devices, and that's um, partly what led me back to doing a lot of work in plain text. Um, and, and, and I'll show a little bit of some of the applications I use. So, but before I get into those applications, if plain text is a little too plain, um, and you know, some people like to be able to separate sections with bold headings you know, as they write. There's also rich text format, which is um, commonly referred to as RTF. It's, uh, it's kind of like a Microsoft Word document file, the .doc or .docx or whatever they're on now um, <laughs> file, um, but like a light version of it. Um, it really has all the formatting you, you probably need. Um, it's, um, it was actually created by Microsoft, I think, in 1987 for uh, Microsoft Word for the Mac. And then since then, every version of Microsoft Word has been able to open 
and save as RTF, as have and other applications have started to adopt have adopted it over time as well. It's it's kind of become a standard format, even though it's still pro my, uh, proprietary Microsoft format. Um, it's still very lightweight, and you can insert pictures and do most of the basic formatting you would need. And it, chances are, if you send an RTF file to somebody who's never heard of it, and they double click on it, it'll open in Microsoft Word for them anyway. So, um, if you happen to say need to draft something on your personal computer at home, and you haven't paid for a license with Microsoft's uh, Word, this is a, a completely viable option that I think not a lot of people consider or think of. So uh, going back to plain text, so, so so imagine that I've convinced you that plain text is the way to go. Well, there's it, there's you know creating a plain text file fine, but what if you have like I do hundreds of plain text files in one directory? How do you really navigate that? How do you find what you need? Um, you know, you don't want to go and start creating folders for everything and trying to organize all that stuff and then trying to drill down. Um, there are two applications that I use. Um, one is called Resoft Notes for Windows. The other is Notational Velocity for Mac. They're both pretty much the same. Resoft Notes is actually a clone of Notational Velocity. Um, basically, what you do is you point it at a uh, folder on the drive, which contains all your plain text notes. And basically, it just it's a very simple three-pane interface. There's a search bar, um, a file listing, and then the actual um, content window. And when you start typing in, in the uh, in the search bar, it does a live search, and any any text file that has any of that text in it will show up in that second pane down. And then the third pane down is the is that actual content. Now, if you start typing in that search bar, and to get to it, all I have to do is hit Control L, and I'm in that search bar if the application is in focus. And um, and I'm not actually searching for something. I actually want to create a new note. I I might just Type a uh, like a date stamp, and then uh, phone call from Bill, and then hit enter, and immediately the cursor goes down to the uh, the content window, and I can just start typing. And I don't have to save or anything; it just instantly creates that text file in that same directory. And um, I basically live in this application, you know, for a large percentage of the day, just because every everything I take notes on is in here: phone calls, meeting notes. Um, if I'm trying to remember, you know, if I, if somebody tells me a, you know, a good movie I should check out or a book I should read, I'll just toss it in here because I know I'll be able to find it really easily later on. Uh, but I, I encourage everyone to check it out. They're both free applications um, and uh, and very handy to use. <coughs> um, another plain text like application is Simple Note. It's I, I call it plain text like because it's actually a hosted service at simplenoteapp.com. And uh, Evernote has been a, a tip in the past, and I'm a I'm a really heavy Evernote user. I've probably I used Evernote before it was uh, purchased and we rebuilt as it is today. It used to just be like a, a one long ribbon. I think this was back in like 2002 um, was when I started using it. And um, and over the years they've added a lot of great features, but over the years that also means that trying to find something that you you know some note you entered in. 2005 about uh, some client or, uh, or whatever else you might have taken a note on takes longer and longer because it's trying to you know search through images that it has done run OCR on or um, <clears throat> it may be trying to search through audio files or video files. Simple Note is basically just Evernote minus all of the other stuff. It's just text um, and even just using the web app is really quick. Um, but it also has an uh, iOS version and I believe they're working on an Android version and um, there's kind of a hint at working on a third platform as well. Um, and the great thing also about Simple Note is that both Resoft Notes and um, Notational Velocity, which was the previous tip, um, sync to Simple Note. So you can actually use Simple Note as a sync service to sync text files between a Mac and Windows machine or uh, an iPhone and, and your Mac or your Windows machine. So um, like Evernote, it is a hosted service, so just be mindful of the fact that anything you add to Simple Note or Evernote, they there's a full version of all of that data on their servers. So, you know, um, do your due diligence in terms of security policies and whether or not that's something that you are comfortable with. I think um, I think Patrick might have covered one of these uh, and a similar app to these to these two. Um, 
keyboard app launchers, ever since I've discovered them, um, I have not been able to use a computer without them. Um, basically what they do, I think Patrick mentioned Col Colibri, which is very similar. Uh, you set up a keyboard sequence like uh, alt space, that keyboard key combination, and it'll pull up this window. That's a screenshot of Launchy on the left for Windows. Um, and when you start typing, so if I started typing Firefox, for example, it would it would predict that I wanted to um, launch a, a new window of Mozilla Firefox or Trillion, or um, it actually works with files. If you catalog the files, uh, can work with um, you know like iTunes files if you want to play a certain song. And uh, on the Mac side, there's LaunchBar, which does uh, does something very similar and these are great because you can also launch uh, websites that are either in your in your browsing history or bookmarked. Um, so, you know, I as a you know at ProbonoNet, I'm on our ProbonoNet sites several times a day throughout the day, and instead of you know opening a browser, uh, mousing up to the the um, the address bar and then typing in ProBono.net slash NY or whichever site I'm going to, if I can just hit alt space, start typing PRO, and immediately I would get a long list of all of the various pro bono net sites that I've you know navigated to over time. And then I can just keyboard down to the one I want, hit enter, and then you know it, it opens. So it saves an, an, an immense amount of time and it saves me from having to take my fingers off the keyboard and reaching over for the mouse. So definitely a, a really huge uh, time saver for me. This next one, I uh, this next tip I claimed by dint of having an insomnia and getting my tips into Travis first before everybody else. Um, this tip, I think everybody wanted to talk about because it's so mind-blowingly just uh, really just awesome. It's a uh, it's called If This Then That. It's a service that uh, kind of serves as a pipe that connects the internet, inter various internet services to each other. Um, it's hard to explain to think of that conceptually. So I pulled up some examples of recipes that, that the community has created already. So if you use the service, you can set it up so that any Facebook photo that's tagged with your name automatically gets copied to a Dropbox folder of your choosing. Um, that includes you know, embarrassing pictures that your friends put up from like a party in college that you maybe don't want to be out there. Um, and if you're not paying attention to Facebook, maybe you might never notice that it got it up there, but you can uh, you can go to Dropbox. You, I mean, you can just set this up and just let it run, and go to Dropbox every once in a while, look to see what it's what's been uh, saved there, and, and um, maybe send an angry email to your friends. Um, you can also archive all of your tweets, and this kind of scratches an itch that I've had for a little while, and I think many people have had, where um, you know tweets are supposed to be uh, temporary; they're ephemeral. They're not supposed to be a permanent record. But a lot of us use the internet as a sort of history of what we're thinking. Um, and particularly for Twitter, it's, I think that's a particularly good way to sort of use, a, create almost like a journal of things that have caught your interest over time. Um, you can set it up so that any tweet that you have will archive to Evernote. Um, and then the third one in a similar vein, uh, you can actually set it up so that any Foursquare check-in that you have will create a calendar event, say, in Google Calendar for you. And so you could set up a special calendar just for Foursquare check-ins, and then you basically have a journal of you know, every restaurant you've ever been to or every you know, um, place you've ever visited where you've checked in. Um, I think the possibilities are endless, and the service is relatively new. So the, I think the community of people who are playing around with this are you know, they're already getting pretty creative and, and I'm excited to see what else comes out of this. The next one is, is something I'm relatively new to, which, and I'm kind of kicking myself for not learning about this stuff sooner, text substitution tools. I think there, this may have been a t tip in the past, but I think it bears repeating just because of how, you, how insanely useful it is. Um, Active Words for Windows or Text Expander for the Mac are both tools where you can type an abbreviation or a key phrase, and these are things that you can set up yourself. Um, these are called snippets in Text Expander. So, for example, the snippet comma comma a d d y um, or addy will result in uh, you know a full address getting um, getting inserted wherever you type that snippet. And um, there's a ton of uses for this. I use it for um, for email signatures because I have you know lots of different email accounts, and try, rather than trying to figure out how to set up signatures on different email accounts. 
I just um, create snippets. I also use different email signatures depending on if I'm replying to somebody or if I'm writing a new email. And so I just create different snippets for my different email signatures. Um, you can also use it for canned emails. Um, I also like to use it for date stamps and timestamps. So when I'm creating one of my many hundreds of te uh, text files as like a note, so say I got a I get a phone call and I want to start taking a, a you know recording a note on the phone call, I have a snippet that's uh, basically F D A T E F date, and as soon as I t finish typing that, it will insert an accurate uh, time time and date stamp that includes the year, the month, the day, and the time down to the minute. And then in the future, if I'm searching for, you know, things that, you know, I know I, I had a call on September 28th, I can just enter that date in in, in my um, search and it will pull up that note. So it saves me from actually having to look at the clock and typing in the, the, the date and the time. Um, it, it may seem like a really basic thing and probably not that useful to somebody who types quickly. Um, and I, I consider myself a pretty fast typer. And in four weeks of very light use, and I say very light because I'm just learning um, about this stuff and, and learning how to use it, I've saved 26, over 26,000 characters typed, and, and that's been an over an hour of my life saved. So if you imagine if I you know, was leveraging it more and using it more heavily, and then over years of time, <laughs> how much time you can save typing. Um, and also make sure that you, you know, you're not making typos because you've, you've saved those snippets. So. Um, so I highly recommend these text substitution tools. Oh, also it's great for coding if you ever have to hand code HTML or uh, hand code anything. Um, text snippets uh, save so much time in, in creating those flags. Um, password security. Um, I'm sure this has been brought up many times before, um, and I'm sure that the panelists for the series of tech tips will keep bringing it up because uh, it just it. it it can't be overemphasized. Um, it can't be emphasized enough that everyone needs to just be really mindful about password uh, security, be especially as we're trying to sign in for all these new services. You know, there have been a ton of great services mentioned today that where you'll need to create a password. You need to use a different password for every site. I I say that knowing full well that many, many, many of you will not do that, but really try because uh, you know the Docker Media hack um, services, servers, when they got hacked, exposed email addresses and passwords for thousands of people. And uh, who knows, if they use that same email address and password for, uh, say, their medical, you know, their medical insurance site or their bank records or, or whatnot, um, an enterprising hacker could really, really mess up uh, your life. So really try to use a different password for every site. And one easy way to do that is to use a password keeper like LastPass or one, uh, one password. LastPass, is, they're both cross-platform, uh, so can be used on Mac or PC. Um, and the difference between the two, LastPass stores your service, your passwords on their servers, um, but it's end-to-end -end encryption, so that means that uh, they actually do not have access, their employees don't have access to the contents of your um, data. Uh, the employees don't have the encryption keys, so they can't see what's in your data. Uh, one password stores your information locally. Um, and, uh, and originated as a Mac application, but now is available on Windows as well. Uh, both have iOS apps also, um, and I think probably Android versions for LastPass. I'm not positive. Um, and basically, you just set um, one master password, and and then it will store all of your other passwords. And it can also they'll create um, really, really basically um, unhackable passwords that are random strings of capital and lowercase letters and maybe characters if you if the website permits it. And um, you can use the random password generator to, to create passwords for new sites, store it in one of these password keepers, and then the only thing you need to remember is your master password. Now obviously your master password has to be really strong and protected as well. So um, one recommendation from um, David Sparks, who is a lawyer and an author who writes about um, uh, using computers. Uh, I think primarily he focuses a lot on Macs, but he recommends changing your passwords twice a year uh, with the clocks. So we're coming up on the end of daylight savings times. When you, when it's time to change your clock, check your smoke detector batteries and change your master password for your password keeper. It's a, a pretty 
I think a, a pretty nice little trick to just remember to you know engage in some best practices around internet security. Next tip is about email search. Um, it's sort of a general, uh, probably general complaint of mine more than a tip. But, um, sorting emails into folders is really a leftover sort of way of thinking about email as a physical object, and it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, it's never made sense to me since the days of my first email account where I um, was able to save email into folders. It just didn't, you know, I didn't know which folder to put it in. Should I put it in the folder of the, you know, the company that sent it or the, the project it was related to or the person that sent it or the year or the months or, you know, just I, I could never really figure out how I wanted to organize that stuff. Um, you know, any one email could go into many different folders and heaven forbid you have an email that actually discusses five different projects in it. You know, then there's no one place that you can put it that would, where it would really make sense for you to go look, looking for it. So, um, so as soon as I could, I tried to find ways to abandon sorting as a paradigm. Um, um, and, you know, when I got Gmail, I, I, I really sort of got Gmail. I really, it, it became my default, uh, you know, I don't sort at all in Gmail. I just basically archive every single email I get and, and search. And I've been able to find emails really quickly. You know, um, recently there was some question about, you know, what were the what were those cameras that Mike Manahan, Monahan mentioned that are usable with the uh, ProvotoNet webcasting module? And within, you know, within a few keystrokes, I found it. And it was, you know, some email from March 3rd that Mike sent to the LSN top listserv. And, um, if I had filed that away, I don't think I would have ever found it. I wouldn't even have tried, basically. <laughs> I would have just let it go. I wouldn't have tried to look for it. If you can't use Gmail and you're stuck using Outlook, um, you can try these two add-ons for Outlook. Zobni, which is inbox spelled backwards, is a great um, add-on that I think indexes your, your email uh, store, your PST file. Um, so it does a really quick search and also allows you to quickly pull up emails that are sent from one person. So, and that's typically how I find things is I don't remember what project it was related to. I remember who sent it. And so I'll, I'll just look for that. And that actually um, makes Outlook kind of more usable to, for me at least. And Neo Email Organizer by a company called Kaelo is a great um, add-on for Outlook. It actually is an application that resides on top of Outlook. So you have to have Outlook running and then you open Neo on top of it. And um, I used to use this a lot. Um, when I was using Outlook heavily and had to uh, um, save emails based on, you know, the client or the, the matter type or, or, you know, just basically there were lots of different ways of parsing how to save an email and Neo was a, a great way to organize all of that. Um, so there's, if there's one running theme in, in all of our presentations, it's that the, you know, the three of us so far who have spoken on this webinar I've probably each been on the on in a 50 email thread of replies and uh, you know involving five or six people trying to schedule a phone call or a meeting and it just it drives me nuts it drives me crazy to try to schedule anything by email um, particularly as um, as Patrick mentioned with people outside of your shared calendar network so um, the two options mentioned before are great. Um, when is good and also um, Google Calendar appointments. These are two other options. Doodle. Doodle is great because um, anybody can just go to doodle.com, set up a, uh, a an attempt to schedule an email. Uh, you block off the dates um, that you want and then the times that are um, that you're trying to schedule for, and then you basically you, you get a link that you can email to everybody who needs to weigh in and you don't need to log in or register and the, the re recipients of that link also don't need to log in or register all they do is uh, is click on the link enter their name on the left and then check off the times that are uh, good for them and um, after everyone's weighed in uh, at the bottom you'll see a number saying you know four out of five people think that uh, you know Tuesday the 23rd at 10 a.m. work. Um, uh, it's just, it's so much quicker than trying to send emails back and forth. Um, TangleMe is very similar to, to uh, Google Calendar appointments. You s sign up for an account, and then you can actually import your personal calendars, whether they live in Outlook or um, Google Calendar or, uh, 
Sunbird, I think, is the the Mozilla freeware version of the calendar. Um, and you don't have to expose your personal appointments to people. They'll just see that those times are not available. And then if somebody's trying to schedule a time with you, you just send them a link to your TungleMe account and tell them to choose from a time that you're available. And you can, you know, you can set a uh, start and end date to your work day so people aren't trying to schedule a 10 p.m. meeting with you. But, uh, you know, both very good options. Um, I, I highly recommend trying both out. Um, and Doodle is, is really lightweight, so it's very easy to, to get into. Right, just uh, a few more tips for me. Uh, Google grab bag, just a bunch of random things. Um, offline Gmail is available again. Um, Google used to have a service called Google Gears that allowed offline use of web sites. Um, they discontinued it, as they do with many other products. Um, but they brought Google offline Gmail back using HTML5. Um, you have to install it in the Chrome browser from the Chrome App Store. Um, it's free, but you have to run it in Chrome. Um, it works. It doesn't cache all of your emails, just recent ones, but handy for you know flights if you want to take care of you know your inbox while you're flying, and you don't need to refer back to emails from years ago. Um, it it works just fine. Um, and the Google's promised that they're going to bring calendars and and documents offline as well, which I think will increase the usability or the value of that, um, and you know really really make it a much more um, useful tool. Google Hangouts, uh, Google Plus is now open to everybody. Um, it's no longer invite only, which is great. Um, but beyond that, they've also added new features to Google Plus Hangouts. Hangouts are basically persistent video chat rooms. Um, and it was kind of fun at first when they launched and pe people were playing with it. We played with it a little bit at ProBonaNet just to see, check it out. Um, it was pretty limited because it was basically just video chat um, and you could share YouTube videos <laughs> with each other. But now they've added broadcasting. So Hangouts are limited to 10 people still to participate, but I think you can broadcast to basically the world. You can send the Hangout link and people who can't get into the Hangout can still watch the Hangout. Um, screen sharing is now allowed and um, mobile Hangouts have also been enabled through the Android app and I think also a web based uh, a web app for iOS and uh, they've also released an API so I think the developer community will really um, latch onto this as uh, something to play around with them with the recent sort of struggle to uh, recover from some of the um, go to meeting for, uh, the Citrix accounts um, sort of ending for a lot of uh, organizations that might be something as a that's a viable option for at least for internal meetings. I don't know about external meetings, but maybe like your own distributed team could start thinking about Google Hangouts as a as an option. Um, one more Google item: uh, Google Flight Search. So back earlier this year, Google purchased ITA, which is a flight uh, data service. Um, they cleared the antitrust hurdles that were brought. <laughs> Uh, that were thrown up when they were, were trying to buy the service and now they've launched Google Flight Search. Uh, just go to google.com slash flights and then you'll see uh, a pretty clean interface. You just enter where you're trying to go to. Uh, Google in its creepy Google way knows where you are so you don't need to enter that piece so you can change it if you're not searching to for a flight from where you are. Um, and it will ter return a you know very clean list of flights with price uh, schedule and uh, airline and you can sort by any of those factors. Um, there's some other features. The UI is a little bit sort of engineering, you know, it's not um, as user friendly as some other services, particularly uh, Hitmonk is still my favorite um, service, but um, but it's something to keep an eye on also, you know, easy to remember. Um, also, if you just entered uh, a travel, I itinerary basically into the regular Google search bar, you can get um, flight results um, in the search results without having to navigate to a site. So that's that second screenshot, the lower screenshot. Um, so, you know, if you start entering New York to San Francisco, um, you can get a text-based list of flight times, uh, airports, and um, what days of the week they, they fly um, right there in your search results. Okay, and a uh, final tip for me, I'm sorry if I've taken more than my share of time. Um, so 
everyone knows, or anyone who pays attention to um, mobile phones, smartphones, and particularly iPhones, knows that uh, Google or Apple's about to make a big announcement on October 5th, and it's a poorly kept secret that it's going to be the new version of the iPhone. Um, for the you know, for those out there who are thinking about upgrading or um, you know, possibly diving into the world of the iPhone, the dilemma remains: what do you do with your old phone? Well, um, I've tried eBay and Craigslist, and they're fine, but it takes a lot of work, and I'm kind of lazy when it comes to things like that. So, um, I was thrilled a couple years ago to discover Gazelle.com, um, which has been amazing. It's uh, it's basically um, a service where you enter. You, you search for the product you're trying to sell to them. Um, they have a, a huge database of things from you know old netbooks, DVD players, scanners, um, basically old electronics. I wouldn't be surprised if they have it in their database old VCR players. Um, and you enter the condition of the of the item, and they'll give you an estimate. And uh, you can either ask them to send you a box, or you can mail it in yourself. And once they confirm the condition of the of the item, they'll either send you a check or you can get um, credits applied to an Amazon account or uh, I think they can pay you by PayPal. There's a lot of different options. Um, you can also enter items that, that they won't be able to, to resell, so they won't give you money for, but they'll recycle it. So and I've recycled old broken um, cell phones, cell phones that don't work anymore. I didn't want to just throw them in the landfill. Um, I entered them in, and they said, well, it's, you said it's broken, so we can't sell it, but if you send it in, we'll recycle it responsibly. Um, and in addition to that, Gazelle um, offers a program called Gazelle for Good, where you can set up a page that you can send to your donors, asking them to send in their old electronics and gadgets that, that maybe are collecting dust in their closets, and the money that would normally, normally go to them would get donated to your organization. So... That's it for me. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, those are wonderful. Um, so, folks, um, we're just at about 8 after 3 um, Eastern Time. Um, I have a few tech tips that I'm going to run through, and then we'll open the floor up for questions from um, folks. And so um, get ready to raise your hand in a few minutes if you have any questions. And we'll also tackle any questions in the, in the Q&A panel. Uh, that we haven't got to yet. Um, so my first tech tip is um, this uh, free application called Maryfy, and this is um, an application that might actually have been useful for us about an hour ago. Um, the New York office briefly lost internet connection and Tony wasn't able to log in at the beginning. Um, but basically it's a free piece of ad supported software that I believe was initially developed by Microsoft that you can install on any computer that has a Wi-Fi connection in it, um, which now would include some probably pretty old and inexpensive um, laptops. And then you can wirelessly share its internet connection um, with any other um, computer or mobile phone or even uh, netbook or even cameras um, in the vicinity, much like um, a, a Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, and there are some configurable options. You can set it up like, you know, airport, hotspots where other computers can't see each other, or you can configure it so that all computers on the Wi-Fi LAN can see each other and talk to each other. Uh, but I thought that was kind of a neat piece of free software that allows you to create a, um, a local Wi-Fi hotspot if you have an internet connection, um, including a, a cellular card and want to share it with um, nearby devices. Uh, this is another kind of cool little um, mobile app that I happened to stumble upon a few days ago. It's called um, Web Camera from a company called, I think it's pronounced Mobiola. And um, this is a mobile application that you put on your iPhone and then several other smartphones. I don't think their Android app is out yet, but they have uh, Blackberry and Windows mobile versions, I believe. And um, after you install it on your um, on your mobile device that has a camera on it, you also install this very small free sort of server software on your desktop computer or laptop. And if your mobile device is connected to the same Wi-Fi network as your computer is, it connects automatically to that computer and acts like a USB webcam. So um, it basically fools the computer into thinking a USB streaming webcam is connected to it. And um, we tested it out and you can, um, after you connect your iPhone or iPod touch with camera to it, um, you can 
stream it into applications like Skype or even GoToMeeting's new uh, webcam support module. And we even tested it with the um, the webcasting module on the Advocate uh, Advocate platform, and it worked through the Advocate uh, or through the webcasting module as well. And you could record directly in there. And um, so we don't necessarily recommend that for capturing live streaming, but it worked surprisingly well, including the audio. So we thought that was kind of a neat use of um, a Wi-Fi connected uh, mobile device. It can also be used with an iPad. Uh, yes. Camera. Yes. Yep. Good point. Um, so this next one is called Browse Aloud, and um, th at the basic level, this is an embedded widget that you can configure and put on your website that then users can click and have it play back text by mousing over different sections of the website. Um, uh, this, this was a tech tip passed on um, from Will Nate and Egrin in, um, in New York. And I just thought this was a really interesting service. It's not something that I've been able to use, um, and it's not free um, for organizations, although there may be certain nonprofit pricing for it. Um, but as an organization, you can provide this widget, and you have a pretty good deal of flexibility over, over the voice and over the features of it. But then it just sort of lives as a little button on your website, and then users um, can click that and use that to navigate the website um, by having it read, read them back to them. And um, we'll circulate. Um, the materials with this afterwards, um, the recording and the slide deck, and make sure to include links on here because there's a really interesting collection of links of government websites, for example, that are using this service that I wasn't even aware of. Uh, this is a really interesting accessibility tool. Uh, this next tool is called Go Animate. Um, I first became aware of this at the um, uh, Software Representative Litigants Conference in San Francisco. Um, the folks at the Sacramento Law Library used this simple animation tool to create this really great um, public um, educational material on um, providing service. And they used the Go Animate to create these character animations. And it's a really cool service that um, you can create these neat animations, um, including voices, and have them have it scripted and have the characters move around and have, you know, anim animated backgrounds. And you don't have to know anything about, you know, being a cartoonist or artist or animator. And you can choose to purchase more advanced features, like you can purchase different character designs and things like that. Um, but it's a really interesting way of providing, um, you know, public, public educational, community educational materials. And, um, the Sacramento Law Library did a great job integrating this with PowerPoint style slides and voiceovers and then cut to um, showing these characters interact with um, surfing papers. And it's, it's, it's pretty funny too, actually. I really recommend people go check it out. Um, and like I said, that link's kind of long, but we'll, we'll provide the link um, afterwards. Um, this next app I just thought was kind of uh, interesting um, in terms of um, disaster preparedness. I actually somehow wasn't completely aware that FEMA had created this, so it may be a little bit old. But they have an Android mobile app that's basically um, an emergency preparedness kit, and it has a lot of um, sort of you know static um, information in it in terms of like you know what do you do before, during, and after um, different types of natural disasters. And it has, um, you, you can drill down and read mobile optimized versions of um, a lot of the content they have on their, on their website, which is useful. Um, it also has you know, like an emergency supply kit checklist. Um, but it also allows you to add in, you know, your own meeting location. So you, so you could, you know, if you have a family or a group of friends or, um, or a workplace um, where you want to have sort of a you know a disaster plan, you can have a common list of you know meeting places in the event of a disaster, including um, you know primary in town lo physical locations as well as, as well as contact numbers, um, out of town locations, and things of that nature. Um, and then it also it also contains links to the FEMA blog that updates and their news pages. Um, and all of their social media outlets. Um, but I just thought it was a really interesting um, use of a, a mobile, uh, you know, public public information app that provides all this in a, in a mobile optimized format, and also provides the user to enter in their own information to create their own sort of, you know, mobile emergency kit. And uh, FEMA also has their own set of tech tips in terms of um, how to have your um, your tech preparedness uh, in the event of disaster. I'm at the link at the bottom of the slide. Um, this next one is called iMacros. This is actually a Firefox extension. Um, this is a really interesting tool. Um, for folks that don't know, a macro is, is 
it's basically, if you've used Excel, you may have seen this occasionally, but a macro is basically an action or a command that when you, when you, when you select it or fire it off, it then fires off a series of other commands. So it allows you to wrap up you know, a complex series of actions into, into one command to make um, you know, complex tasks uh, easier to, to automate. And iMacros brings this to the web browser. And at the very basic level, um, it provides this pane on the left-hand side of your screen and that lets you record what you're doing on the screen. Um, it's not exactly like GoToMeeting, and then it's not recording at all visually, but it's recording the code of what you're doing. So if you click on a button, it says it knows that you, you know the proper command for I've clicked this button. If you enter tat enter text in a form field, it records the code for the form field that you've entered in as well as the content. So at a very basic level, this is really useful for automating repetitive tasks in which you're often entering the same information over and over again. Um, uh, you know, bug reports is one thing that a couple of us have used it internally for to automate common types of bugs, and then we can fill in all the unique information without refilling in all the other forms individually. And you can also use this for um, obviously any website that has forms, including the, the Promoter and Advocate template, and. Uh, with a little with a little bit of elbow grease, we found out that you can actually feed it data from a comma separated file from Excel and get it to do much more um, complex um, and operations in in bulk. Um, so the ex one example of this is that um, we needed to upload. Um, a couple hundred resources into an advocate library. So after fiddling around and, and recording the, the the steps it takes to add a, a resource to the library tool on the advocate template, um, we created a sort of a simple spreadsheet of all of the form fields that we filled out um, in there. And then with each column being a form field, we filled in all the various information that would go in uh, for for each resource. Um, and so then after that spreadsheet was collected and we had a folder full of all of the attachments that were going to be uploaded, we could basically click the play button and it looped through and uploaded 200, and 200 or so documents into an advocate resource library without having to do each one manually. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty interesting exercise. It obviously takes time to create you know, a data spreadsheet if you don't have that information available in a structured form anyways, but in this case we actually kind of did. Um, so um, with a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of customizing of the code that it spits out, um, we created this, this workflow to upload um, uh, documents into the advocate library in bulk. And it's really, it's really kind of interesting because when you hit play it, in, the, in your browser screen, it walks through. It's like it takes control of your browser and so you can see it step through each form and that's really cool the first time and then after about the fifth time it's not quite as cool and you can walk away from it and let it do its business. Um, but it turned out to be a really interesting tool and in a very basic level you can automate some repetitive tasks and if you choose to get you know a little bit more into it you can really do some interesting um, operations um, at a, in a very high number. Um, this next one, this is just kind of an interesting way to create your own sort of customized online new newspaper, and you can um, you can basically turn any feed, a Twitter feed, an RSS feed, or basically anything else that emits some type of feed, you plug it into your account on this, and then it creates um, this sort of newspaper layout you can see in this. Um, this was kind of an interesting one that someone created on immigration reform where they fed a bunch of um, news websites and uh, blogs and Twitter accounts into this and it creates this custom um, sort of news portal um, on immigration reform. Um, you, this could be used in a lot of ways. You can use it for your own personal interest, I guess, as sort of a passive news reader where you plug it in a bunch of stuff that you're interested in. Um, to read for yourself or maybe that you want to share with friends, but you can obviously also create, you know, you can create one for your organization where you're pulling RSS feeds from your program's website, from statewide websites that you're participating in, for partners' websites or um, other news, 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 um, online news organizations that are providing information. Um, that you think would be relevant to folks, and um, people can subscribe to it. This through RSS, and I believe there's even, um, you know, it, it can hook into post to your Twitter and hook in uh, for email subscriptions. Um, th this next one is a mobile app. Um, this is a mobile check-in app, and I, this is one thing I haven't used. I think it's just out a couple of days ago. What I thought was particularly interesting 
interesting about this was trying to apply a lot of the social interactions of Foursquare style check-ins to um, work and group collaboration. And like some of the other themes here, one of the goals that they had was to reduce email um, communication within teams. Um, there's a lot of sort of buzzwords associated with it. They believe that, you know, um, by, by integrating check-ins into sort of business that they increase transparency and change the way man project management works. But I think what's really interesting is that um, the, the core of, of why they think this is useful is that um, it's, it's looking at social networks not just as collections of people but collections of social objects. So instead of j just checking into places um, in which you and your friends are checking into, you check into social objects like projects, um, customers or client interactions, partners, etc. And so it creates this feed of what you're doing based on the sort of context in which you're doing it. Now, I'm not totally convinced that this is um, would work for me um, or anyone else's organization, but I thought it was a really interesting way to think about communicating what you're working on to your coworkers and possibly even to collaborators across organizations in a way that doesn't um, necessarily mean more emails um, exchanged. Um, this next one is called uh, Thora, I think it's pronounced, and the quotation is how they described it, an intersection of aggregation, creation, and search. It's sort of a new way um, in their view to find um, information across all the social networks and websites that are out there today. Um, it's very simple to set up. You basically plug in some keywords to start with. Um, um, so I plugged in some to free legal help style keywords to see what type of filters or to see what type of um, news posts and resources it will return without customizing it too much. And it was fairly interesting, but you can really get into it and, and choose the weight keywords. Um, so you can say, I want these keywords to be more meaningful in how you um, return content to me. You can also add in feeds into it. You can make suggestions to them about weighting different um, uh, different websites differently within there. So it was just kind of an interesting, interesting concept that I think it's maybe worth to play out um, is, this, is the way that folks are finding um, information through social networks and online search continues to evolve and different, different companies try to, and different organizations try to figure out how to manage the, the search of that. And then this last one, um, the quote at the top is the intersection of paranoia, obsession, and geekiness. I think this quote might be from me based on the last one. Um, I don't necessarily know that I have a great use for this, um, but I really like the idea of Box Me Up. Um, their idea basically is that if you're moving somewhere, say from your house or your office and you're hiring movers, you want to know what's in every single box, but you don't necessarily want the movers to know what's in every single box, right? But you really want a detailed list of everything that's being moved. So what Box Me Up does is it combines a web and a mobile app so that you can create um, lists of each container on the website and add all the items that are in the website, or I'm sorry, that are in the container. After you've listed all the items that are in the box, you can then print out a QR code. And the QR code is the big thing on the right. Um, for folks that don't know what a QR code is, it's kind of like a barcode. Um, but a lot of Android is, I think, really using QR codes a lot. Um, there's some iOS apps that are using it, and perhaps some Windows mobile apps. But basically, you scan the QR code with your mobile camera, and that QR code in, um, encodes some information, oftentimes a URL or some other information within there. And in this case, you just have this QR code on the side of your box, and then you scan it with your um, Android phone or iPhone, and it returns a list of everything that is in the box as you enter on the website. Um, so I, I don't know how useful this is, and I'm not quite that obsessive about uh, my privacy and organizing things, but I thought it was a pretty interesting app, and I think it may have applications for the um, obsessive and private amongst us beyond just simply um, moving from place to place. Um, so thank you all for attending. We have a few minutes left, and I just want to make sure that uh, we have a chance for you all to ask questions. Um, so if anybody has any questions right now, feel free to raise your hand, and I will unmute you, and then uh, you can ask your question. Um, I had a question, um, this may be for Tony, but does, um, does text substitution work with only certain applications? I, I don't have a lot of experience on the Windows side. On the Mac side, Text Expander does actually um, work 
system-wide um, in any application. Uh, Kate, maybe you can speak to the um, witness set. I use auto hot text um, and that uh, it does work better in some um, applications than others that I have um, very little problem using it in Chrome, but that it often has the problems in an Internet Explorer if I'm using it there. Um, and that it does occasionally, um, uh, if your computer's running slowly, it sometimes misses characters. So you have to um, go back and sort of change things, but those are pretty uncommon um, things about it. Uh, so. Okay, so, um, well, great. Um, well, um, thank you all for attending, and I really especially want to thank our great panelists. Um, uh, Kate, Patrick, and Tony did a wonderful job, and uh, we really appreciate them for participating. And um, you'll see on the screen, we have, there's the next uh, trainings coming up in this series. Um, on October 12th, um, we'll have an online intake best practices, and um, in November, we'll have all things mobile. Um, you, as always, you can find um, all the updated training information on lsmtap.org, and... Um, thanks again, and um, if you have any questions about this series, you can contact Allison at ProBonet or Brian um, at LSNTAP and Northwest Justice. Um, all right, thanks a lot, everyone.